Each isotope has its own specific half-life and they can be very different to each other. And we need to consider half-lives when we're assessing the risk involved in using radioisotopes. Now also, they are more or less useful because of those half-lives as well. Here are some examples, and again, you don't need to know these, but it might be a useful thing for you to have some idea of the relative sizes of things so that you can discuss in questions. So smoke detectors have an isotope called americium, and that has a half-life of 432 years. Now that's quite a high risk if contamination occurs because that will be active, that will be radioactive for a very long time. Technetium 99M in medical tracers has a half-life of six hours. That's quite a low risk because even if that was to get contaminated, then it wouldn't be very radioactive for long. So you could maybe seal off that room for a couple of days and be confident that it wasn't very radioactive afterwards. And also because it's used as a medical tracer, it's injected into people, we don't want them to be radioactive for a long time. We need them to be radioactive for long enough to do the test and then go home and not be radioactive. Carbon-14 is a common isotope which is used to date fossils, and that has a half-life of 5,700 years, which is great for dating how old fossils are. And that's a low risk because in most living things, it's a very, very small proportion of, of carbon-14. But it is where the radiation comes from, the background radiation that comes from organic matter. We power some of our spacecraft by plutonium, and uh, that's plutonium-238, and that has a half-life of 88 years. So that's quite a high risk if it was to be leaking during manufacturing, but it's not a very high risk if it leaks in space, because we won't be seeing that spacecraft again. <laughs> We won't be seeing it again, certainly in the near future. Uranium-235 in nuclear power stations has a half-life of seven times 10 to the eight years. So that's a really, really high half-life. Now that is a very high risk of contamination if, um, we, if that leaks. That is a very, very high risk if contamination occurs because that will remain radioactive for a very long time, many generations. Uranium-238 is used to date rocks, rather like carbon uh, dating, but for rocks. And that has a half-life of 4.5 times 10 to the nine years. Again, that's not a very high risk because it is not in very high concentrations in most rocks. But if you were to make a concentrated source of Uranium-238 like Marie Curie did, then that would stay radioactive for a long time and continue to irradiate for a very, very long time. Synthetic atoms like Rutherfordium-254, uh, which is just used in particle physics research at the minute, has a half-life of 2.3 times 10 to the minus five seconds. So that's an incredibly short half-life. And that has a very low risk in any case because it's only manufactured in very, very small quantities. So these different half-lives can be make them more or less risky, but also more or less useful. We can use different units depending on the most appropriate unit for that isotope. So for some things, it's appropriate to measure the half-life in seconds, for others in minutes, in days, in hours. We can use whichever unit is most appropriate as long as you have the same units in time as in half-life. So whichever units they've given you in the question, just continue to use those units. And you'll need to use standard form because some of these half-lives are very, very long and some are very, very short. So you don't need to memorize any of these specific examples but you do need to be able to use numbers like these very very short or very very long half-lives in standard form.